The first time I saw Michael, I could barely distinguish his form as human. His entire body was covered with bandages and casts, and he was attached to a series of weights and counterweights, pulleys, IV feeds and tubes, and a machine to help him breathe. I'd popped my head into the ICU to see the new patient I'd been asked to evaluate, a young man in his early 20s who was the sole survivor of a plane crash. I couldn't believe it. When I looked across the room at him, I actually felt shocked. He looked like he was more machine than man. I was no stranger to the hospital setting, either personally or professionally. I spent a lot of time at bedsides with loved ones, including that of my spouse. I actually spent many anxious hours in the ER and the ICU and paced hospital hallways due to serious health issues that would arise for him. But this vision of Michael was extraordinary. The machines, the equipment that was keeping him alive had a way of depersonalizing the situation in ways I hadn't yet experienced. Taking a deep breath, I approached Michael's bedside, determined to behave like the professional that I am, as I met him for the first time. Michael was still in a coma and in no shape to greet me, let alone participate in any kind of an evaluation. Still, I touched his arm and said, Hi, Michael. I'm Dr. Buckwalter. That simple gesture seemed to add some personalization to the interaction that was there. I wished him well and told him I'd be back. And over the next week, I stopped in to see Michael several more times, and I had an opportunity to visit with some of his family members and his friends. Each of them exhibited their own level of shock and dismay over what had happened to their loved one. They talked about how concerned they were about his injuries and how concerned they were about what his future might look like. At that point, his doctors believed he would survive but they had no conclusions about the extent of his injuries or what kind of a recovery he would make. One day I got a message from Michael's neurosurgeon and he invited me to be in the room to assess and follow Michael's behavior as his medical team reversed this induced coma. I knew that Michael's brain would still be really fragile and that there would be actually very little that he would be able to track and remember um, but one of the things that I didn't recognize at the time is that as Michael's awareness increased, he would begin studying the behavior of the people around him. Once out of his coma, Michael's um, awareness and alertness did increase rapidly. As he began to breathe on his own and eat on his own, a lot of the equipment that he had been using was taken away. He started to sit a little more upright in his bed and little by little interact with the people in the room, which put everyone more at ease, including me. And at that point, there was no question as to whether he was more man or machine. As a psychologist, it was my job to provide support and to assess Michael's mood and his cognitive functioning. How was he adjusting to this horrific thing that had happened to him? How was he doing in terms of his language and his, his memory? How, how had his, um, his uh, ability to focus in and to attend to information been impacted, if at all? In cases like Michael's, you know, as hard as we try, and as much as we, as much as we want it to happen, not everybody makes a full recovery. In cases like Michael's, I've learned to be hopeful and yet realistic. I had hoped that Michael would regain maximum mobility. I had hoped that he would recover to the extent that he would have meaningful relationships and productive work. But I also knew that the possibility existed that he would recover very little and that he would remain impaired and dependent on people for the rest of his life because not everyone gets the Hollywood ending. It became customary for Michael to greet me with this chipper attitude and cheerily ask, how are you, Doc? He, he had that way of putting people uh, at ease in the room. 
but I would typically say fine and turn the conversation back to him, back to how he was doing and how he was adjusting and any changes he was experiencing. I knew better than to talk about myself. We have all been well trained to turn the conversation back to our clients so that they don't use us to move away from some of their own discomfort and pain. So anything that I shared about my personal life, my thoughts, my feelings, was well thought out and kept to a minimum. After assessing Michael's cognitive functioning, we concentrated on how he was feeling. He was actually willing to talk about feelings of sadness and anger, and he spent a fair amount of time talking about how guilty he felt that he was the one that survived. And of course, he talked a lot about his concerns about the future, but most often when I would ask him how he was doing, he would say, I'm doing just fine. <laughs> Given other responsibilities at the hospital, my time with Michael diminished over the weeks that followed. But each time I would stop in to see him, he would say, how are you, doc? And sometimes, just as chipper and just as cheerily, how am I, doc? <laughs> he had a great sense of humor. Um, but one day, when I stopped by, he ax asked me if he could have more time with me. And the look in his eyes let me know that it wasn't a trivial request. I. Uh, just as before, I said, how are things going? And he said, how are you, Doc? And I said, fine. But when I attempted to turn the conversation back to him, he said, no, how are you really? I didn't know how to take this at first, but he had my full attention. Hey, Michael, what's going on with you? He said he wanted to know the impact that he had on me. More specifically, he said, I want to know how seeing this, this broken body, affects you. Tears welled in his eyes, and he said, nobody in my family and none of my friends will tell me exactly what happened. I'm trying to put the pieces back together again, but when I ask them about what happened when I was first found and when I first came to the hospital, no one tells me what that was like for them. When I ask them, they just say, how they're, when I ask them how they're doing, they say fine, I, I, but I can see it in their eyes and I can see it in the way that they behave, that they're as worried about me as I am. They're as worried that I'm not gonna walk again or that I'm not gonna be as smart as I used to be. But truly, when I ask them, they say, fine, just like you do. <laughs> wow. At that point, tears welled in my eyes. His intense, vital words really filled the room. And uh, just this new relationship of humanity bonded us as doctor and patient. We spent a lot of time together that day. I told Michael about that first time that I saw him in the ICU and how hard it was to find the person inside when he was so constrained by all of the equipment that was keeping him alive. I told him about things that were said to him and things that were relayed and things that happened early on when his brain wasn't quite awake enough um, to lay down those new memories. We talked so much about his concerns and, uh, and about what was gonna happen to him. And I listened like I had never listened before. And when he asked me what my concerns about him were, I actually told him. But then he said, do you know very much about what it's like for people who are paralyzed, what life is like for them? I had to catch my breath but no, wanter, no longer wanting to give him a mechanical response, I said, actually, Michael, I'm married to a man who sustained a spinal cord injury and was paralyzed just before his 17th birthday. He's a man who has spent decades of his life ever adjusting to the able-bodied world. Tears streamed down Michael's face, and I had tears too. And he said, now I know you can understand. 
Those transcendent moments changed so much about how I, how I became in the room with my patients. No longer could I hide behind a veil of therapist non-disclosure simply because sometimes my thoughts, my feelings, my shared experiences are the treatment. They are the strong dose of compassion or reality that some pa patients need in order to heal. So now I work really hard when I walk into the room to be very, very present with my patients and to share with them the reality of what I think and what I feel because that's what patients like Michael deserve and they need, someone who is definitely more human than machine.